Okay, can you see my screen all right? I can see it. Great. So um, my name is Lisa Veneer. I'm a research scientist with the Canadian Forest Service here in Sault Ste. Marie. Um, and I've been here for maybe 25 years or so. Um, and I study biodiversity and how it responds to uh, forest management. Um, but a lot of the work I do focuses on birds. And so what I want to talk to you today about is um, uh, how we use forest birds as indicators of sustainable forest management. Let me see if I have. All right. Also technical difficulties, I won't advance the slide. Okay, there we go. Okay, so just to give you a bit of background on on uh, on forests in Ontario, um, and for those of us who live in Sault Ste. Marie, we're, we're, we're very conscious of how important forests are uh, to the Ontario economy. But there are about 71 million hectares of forest in uh, Ontario. About 43 of those are in the managed crown land. So a, a good chunk of the forest is actually north of what we call the area of the undertaking. And that's the managed, uh, managed crown land within Ontario. Um, of that, about uh, 0.18 million hectares burn each year. Uh, 0.45 million hectares are disturbed by insects and disease. And that's primarily spruce budworm, uh, um, jack pine budworm, and uh, uh, tent caterpillar and uh, for those in the Sioux, we, we've been having uh, tent caterpillar uh, defoliation now for the last few years that's been quite uh, uh, intensive. Um, and then as well there's about 0.11 million hectares harvested per year. Um, and there's there's a fair bit of variation around all those numbers especially with with fire. We get a, a, um, we get years even decades where we have a lot of fire and then um, other other periods of time where where we see very little fire. Okay, the, the area of the undertaking is managed through uh, legislation called the Crown Forest Sustainability Act. And, and as part of that, the, the, this area is divided up into what we call forest management units, so FMUs. And you can see um, here, um, uh, Sault Ste. Marie is in the Algoma FMU. Um, and this, this map's color coded. It tells you um, uh, when the next uh, forest management plan is going to be written for these. These are 10-year plans that describe how, the, how and when the forest is going to be harvested. Um, and those ma management plans are developed um, in the context of uh, a lot of, of, of research on, um, on civiculture and on, uh, on uh, ecological integrity. And so the, the part of the Crown Forest Sustainability Act that's sort of more, most relevant to birds is these uh, these guides that are that are uh, part of the management process? And so there's two two guides specifically: um, the guide for conserving biodiversity at stand and site scales, and a forest management guide. And this one's specific for boreal boreal landscape. So it's kind of a site scale uh, uh, guide and a uh, a landscape scale guide. And these guides uh, use um, 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 what they call a coarse and fine filter approach. So what that means, the coarse filter approach means that, that um, they, take, they use a process called natural disturbance emulation. So what we're looking for when we manage forests is a condition that is similar to what we expect to be natural. And the, our forests are disturbance driven. So there's all sorts of disturbances that naturally happen on these landscapes. And what we want is for, for forest harvest to be as similar to those uh, disturbances as possible. And so we emulate that through uh, harvesting in, in a in a spatial way that sort of mimics mimics the way fires burn, for example. But this is really a hypothesis. It's like basically we're saying we we think that we are going to manage for most biodiversity if we if we manage in a way that's very similar to natural disturbance. But we need to test that hypothesis. And in order to test that hypothesis, we need data. And the kind of data that some of the best data to do that is is through birds. So. What makes a good ecological indicator something that can help us understand whether forest management is effectively emulating natural disturbance and is conserving the ecological integrity of these forests? Well, you, you can imagine that collecting data on a scale of, of the Ontario uh, managed forests is incredibly expensive. So the, the easier it is to collect that data and the lower the cost, the better. 
Um, we want good repeatable measurement protocols. So we want to be able to do stuff in a standardized way year after year that, that makes it comparable across space and across time. We need to understand, uh, we need indicators that, that are easy to interpret in terms of, of how the environment is expected to change with, um, with forest management. Um, it, it needs to integrate complex ecosystem information. It needs to have a well-developed taxonomy. So we need to be able to identify these, these species easily and have good tools for doing that. And it needs to be sense, these indicators need to be sensitive to, um, to the changes of the stressors that we expect to see because of forest management. And so I think you, you, you guys are all birders. So you, you know that I, as I went through that list, probably that you know that birds fit all of those criteria and that makes them an, ex, an exceptional taxonomic group for trying to understand whether our forest management practices are, um, are, um, are ecologically sustainable uh, and, and are preserving the ecological integrity of the, of the forest system. So uh, we have standardized methods of sampling. Um, you, you've, you've all been involved in that, whether it's through eBird or doing point counts for the Atlas. Um, a lot of the sampling that we do is auditory for birds. Um, and, and because of that, we're able to use these autonomous recording units. And I'll talk a little bit about those in a, in a minute. Um, obviously, the taxonomy is well known and we have good tools, field guides and that sort of thing to help us uh, learn uh, and identify birds. We have really good knowledge of life history, and that's that's uh, that's not trivial. This is a really it's a really important when we see changes in bird numbers, abundance, density, um, that we're able to understand what the mechanisms of mechanisms of impact are, because we know uh, how birds are using uh, are using habitat and how and the sort of the processes that they're using. Um, birds are diverse, so uh, I mean, uh, it, a lot of the forests that we're working in here, we, we might get up to 70 different species um, uh, in, in, a, in diverse habitats um, that, that integrate all of the ecosystem processes, so that's really useful. Birds are popular. That's not a necessary fact feature for good indicators, but it certainly helps, especially when you think about the kinds of citizen science efforts that go into collecting bird data that, um, that you guys are all involved in. Um, Birds we know respond to known stressors that that happen because of forest management. Things like um, uh, lowering the the the, the age, age class of, of forests, the conversion of conifers to mixed woods, um, the loss of dead wood or standing dead trees, that kind of stuff. So we know that there are certain bird species that respond specifically to those stressors, and there's a large body of regional data available through all of these. Um, all of these things like eBird and Breeding Bird Atlas and Breeding Bird Survey and all of that sort of thing. So um, uh, that gives us context for, for understanding how uh, birds are changing with respect to, um, uh, to forest management. So how do we count birds? Um, uh, as you all know, birds are, are uh, uh, spend a lot of time singing and so that's one of the primary ways especially in terms of counting uh measuring abundance in a standardized way we use um we use auditory bird signals so uh this is these are this is a sonogram from uh, a, reco a recording from um, the Sault Ste. Marie area um, and you can see that there's um for example this golden crown kinglet um that there's uh this is probably the same individual um, but you can see that the pattern is slightly different, and that's the, that's the the trick with bird song is that individuals uh, have there's variety in song in, within individuals between individuals, and there's some pretty cool sort of geographic variation associated with that song, uh, and that that makes the identification of birds with uh, through song uh, a really complex task and something that takes years uh, to become proficient at, and it's one of the reasons why we are currently struggling to develop what I would call um, automated approaches to, to, um, to recognizing birdsong on recordings, but I'll, I'll, I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, so point count surveys are one of the primary tools that we use for measuring consistently and repeatedly um, uh, bird abundance in, uh, in, in the forest. Um, so uh, as I'm sure I'll, I'll, most of you have, have conducted uh, point counts before, or at least kn know about them through the Atlas. Um, this is uh, where you, you're standing at a, at, a, at a central location and you're listening and watching and recording all the birds you see and hear. And often there's some, um, in, some requirement to, to estimate the distance at which you're hearing different birds, um, usually within some sort of distance bands, whether it's 50 meters to 100 meters or beyond. 
And so um, there is a there is a visual component to this as well, but it's um, a, a lot of it is is auditory. And um, for that reason, we have a fair bit of success collecting bird abundance data using autonomous recording units. So our 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 term for these is a ARUs. And these are two units that we use a lot in Ontario. On the left is uh, is from Wildlife Acoustics. That's the company, and it's uh, what's, it's called an SM4. So it's a fourth generation unit. We've been using these since since the SM1s, um, probably 15 years ago now. Um, they're 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 just getting better through with time. Um, they're very waterproof. Um, they're programmable, and they're super efficient at, uh, at ba using battery power. So these things uh, will have four D cells in them, and uh, we can we can put them out um, in the forest with using uh, snow machines uh, in February. Have them turn on in the spring, collect data all summer, uh, and turn off, and then we collect them again the next winter. Um, and uh, and the and the batteries last that whole time. So it's really effective, especially in, in situations where we um, you know where accessibility is an issue and we need to do that kind of winter deployment. The unit on the right is a um, it's called Bar LT. It's from a, a company called Frontier Labs that comes from Australia, and the Wildlife Service in Ontario is using a lot of these units to to um, to sample in the boreal and in the in the far north in in some of the work that's that's just starting up with Atlas Three right now, um, and so there's a lot of really. I mean, I, I don't. I wouldn't argue that uh, these ARU should replace doing point counts in person, but they can certainly supplement them in in, in a lot of really valuable ways um, and help us collect data that we otherwise wouldn't be able to collect. And I'm just gonna. I, I don't want to th throw too much data at you, but I, I want. I think you 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 would appreciate the. Um, these figures that show we've done some tests with different different uh, different kinds of units uh, against actual in-person observers, and so in this case we're, we're we've got a, a person standing at a point doing a point count. There's a, a, an E A E three A, which is a, a really expensive high-end unit that gives you 360 degree sound. You put headphones on when you listen to these recordings, and it sounds like you're in the forest. Uh, and then the S M ones, which are sort of the old technology. Um, and, and so, uh, if you see along the on the x-axis, you've got visit one through visit five. So visit one is sort of end of May up to visit five, which is beginning of July. And on the y-axis, you have richness. So the number of species that you're getting at a 10-minute point count. And what you can see here is that although there is a little bit, there are small differences in 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 the number of birds that you capture using. Um, uh, using uh, field recordings versus um, sorry, using a field measurement versus a recording, um, you can in fact, um, the, 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 those differences are a lot smaller than the differences that you see over the course of the season. And the one of the advantages of uh, these ARUs is that you can put them all out at the same time early in the season. And so uh, any deficits you have that relative to not doing an actual in-person recording can be offset by by just doing all of your measurements early in the season, because even early in the season, ARUs are much uh, give you much uh, more species than uh, being in person at the end of the season. So one big advantage for sure. Um, another advantage. Uh, so on the x-axis here, we've got one visit versus. Oh, so these are ten-minute visits. So one visit, two visits, three visits, four visits. So four visits is forty minutes of sampling. And if you if you um, you can see that as you add time to your sample, you increase your your number of species that you detect by quite a bit. So again, um, more visits is, is a much better way to go than than or gives you much more sort of bang for your buck than than um, doing in person or really high end recordings than these even these simple SM ones. And so the other piece of that is that. Um, uh, you can imagine if you put a recorder in a site, you can program it to record every day for the whole season. And so you can collect a lot of recorded data. The sort of cost associated with that then becomes much less than what it would cost to send a birder out into the field uh, every day for the whole season. And so this is another way to offset cost a little bit by it get, you get more data and, um, um, and more species. Um, for the same cost, or uh, for that, for the cost of sending someone into the field once to put the recorder out, or do a or do a survey. 
the other thing that really is an advantage of being able to do all of these visits is you can estimate the detectability of your species. I, I know you guys all know that some species are easier to hear than others and some habitats it's easier to hear birds in than others. And so that means that to have comparable data from different sites in different habitats, you need to understand how detectable species are in those habitats. And you, you imagine when you, if you, and normally we would, what we do is five minute counts. We do eight of them in a site. We, we interpret or listen to eight recordings and generate data from that. If we see, for example, if we hear birds in two of those recordings, a territorial species in two recordings out of the eight, we know our detectability is, is 25%. So when the species is there, we're 20, we're, it, the probability of actually observing it is 25%. And we can use those estimates to offset um, differences in species and differences in habitat to, to estimate uh, abundance. And as I mentioned, um, how complex it is to listen to, to identify birds by song. Um, it's something that the human mind can do with training. Um, we are still struggling uh, uh, to come up with um, al computer algorithms to do this. So on the right, we have, this is when I say manual method, it basically what that means is someone's listening to the recording. Um, and recording the species and the automated recognizer is a, uh, a rec recognizers that we build on a for each species to identify a particular bird song. So we use training data that we pull from Cornell and, and uh, some of the other sites and uh, we train the, the recognizer to recognize a species. And what you see is and then on the on the y-axis here is detection probability in order to be certain that's 1.0, to be certain that you're going to detect the species when it's there. Um, when you're listening, it you need to go to well, roughly maybe 11 visits to get 100, to get, to be, to be absolutely certain that you're going to catch it if it's there. But you can see that that's, that you need a lot more visits with the automated recognizer to do that. So the quality of the data that we're getting from these manual method is still way better than, than what we're getting with the automatic recognizer. The other issue here is that these recognizers are, are developed on a per species basis. So you have to run them over and over again for individual species, whereas when you're doing a, an interpretation, when you're listening and writing down all of the birds that you hear, you can do that in one go and identify everything. So there's there's still a lot of um, a lot of kinks to work out of, out of the, the automated process. Um, yeah, I think that's all I'll say about that for now. Oh, uh, the one other one other point. The one place where the automated recognizers are really effective is when you're looking for rare species. And uh, I don't know if Ken McKilrick is on the on the uh, on the call today, but um, uh, he was he's been working on a project uh, to uh, locate Kirtland's warbler in, in northern Ontario, and um, they've been using automated recorders um, and collecting hundreds of hours of recording. Uh, in, an, in sites all in jack pine sites all across uh, Ontario, uh, northern Ontario, and um, these uh, the automated recognizer for Kirtland's warbler can be run sort of overnight on a, on 250 hours or more of recordings. And so, for finding rare species using a lot of recording time, that's when these automated recognizers really shine. Um, uh, so it's super useful for that for that sort of application, but not great for this sort of whole community kind of analysis yet. Although I, I think that's coming at, eventually. Um, some of the data that, that exists for the um, managed forests in Ontario include breeding bird survey data. This is just the, 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 the squiggles are breeding bird survey routes from 1996 to 2014. Some of these have been done once, some uh, every year for that period. Um, but you can see, although there, it's a good distribution, like it covers the whole area, it's not very dense. We don't have a, a ton of this data. And um, you can see the same is true for the Atlas data from the second Atlas. Um, the issue here is that uh, a lot of the data that we re rely on with birds is citizen science data. And citizen science data is best collected in places where there's lots of citizens. So our populations are low in Northern Ontario. And so we, we don't um, have it maybe have as, uh, uh, as much data collection going on in the north as we need. And, and in this case, in, the, in this atlas, we actually supplemented that data collection with uh, paid crews to collect data for the atlas. Um, but just a plug for if you're in southern Ontario and you uh, are looking for an adventure, maybe not this summer because of COVID, but hopefully in the next four years, um, and, and you want a, a road trip to northern Ontario, um, we're always looking for more data. Uh, for the Atlas in Northern Ontario. 
So the other piece of the puzzle for, for thinking about forest management, um, evaluating forest management um, is, 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 is habitat. And um, you can spend a lot of time, you can imagine going to a site and collecting bird data. It, it, it takes um, 10 times as much time to collect good vegetation data at a, at a site. Um, if you're measuring things like uh, tree species composition and um, uh, stem density and understory composition and structure and all of those things. And something that we're exploring, um, this is uh, Rich Russell from the Canadian Wildlife Service, uh, is, the, um, is using photo plots. So rather than relying on uh, vegetation experts at every plot, we, we take a series of 12 photos um, at the plot. We're exploring this with the Atlas data in Northern Ontario. Um, and then we'll use these, so it, it's basically looking north, south, east, and west, and um, looking 45 degrees up straight ahead and 45 degrees down, and then using all of those pictures to, to do a base, basically an ecological interpretation or a habitat interpretation of that site. Um, and uh, we're hopeful that that's going to give us some really good habitat data that was, that was uh, somewhat missing from some of the Northern Ontario um, Atlas collection last time around. The other kinds of habitat data that we use are from remote, uh, for species composition is remote sensing. So on the right, this is based on satellite data, Landsat TM, which is a 30 meter resolution. So you're looking at 30 meter um, blocks, uh, identifying uh, uh, habitat in 30 meter blocks. But you can see that it's, this in particular is quite coarse. Normally, uh, I couldn't find a good image, but um, normally we, we're pretty good at distinguishing between conifer and deciduous with the satellite data, but, but uh, not very good at distinguishing actual species. On the left is, the, is uh, output from forest resource inventory interpretation. And forest resource inventory is um, done from uh, aerial photos, uh, three-dimensional aerial photos. The interpreter has ground truth data to look at to calibrate what they're seeing. And they draw polygons around homogeneous um, forest types and then estimate the species composition and various other characteristics of the forest, like age, age and height and that sort of thing. So you can see, for example, that this, uh, this polygon here is jack pine, uh, 50%, black spruce, 20%, uh, trembling aspen, 20%, and white birch, 10%. And this is this is this the FRI data uh, when it's accurate is is really uh, is really useful data for uh, doing any kind of habitat uh, assessments for for birds um, in the forest context. The other kind of so that's um, basically um, what we call passive remote sensing. We're taking just taking an image, but the other kind of remote sensing is active, and this is uh, an example of uh, lidar. So um, this is a uh, some FMUs, some forest management units in Ontario use, have already got LIDAR, but right now the province of Ontario is in the process of collecting LIDAR for the whole province. And that's a process that's probably going to take about 10 years. Um, but what happens with uh, active remote sensing like LIDAR is that the, the sensor sends a pulse down from the plane. It hits vegetation and bounces back up. And because the, the altitude of the plane is known and the time it takes for the pulse to, to bounce, to go down and bounce back up is known, you can calculate the height at which the, the, um, the pulse encountered vegetation. The other really good thing about LIDAR is that each pulse can produce multiple returns. So that just means that not all of the energy is used up at the, in the, when it encounters the first piece of vegetation. So you actually get points of vegetation uh, lower down in the canopy. And what this thing, gives you um, is a point cloud that that describes the structure of the forest and as I'm sure you all know um, yes habitat uh, tree species composition and understory composition are important for bird habitat but the other piece of the puzzle is is um, is the habitat structure or vegetation structure that's that's a really important variable for uh, for birds um, and so we're exploring uh, different metrics of understory vegetation structure from these LIDAR point clouds. And this, this plot up here just shows you that uh, on the, on the x-axis is what the LIDAR is telling us about the structure and the understory. And this axis is telling us what, the, what our field measurements of the structure is, is, um, tells us. And the fact that this, it, these things cluster around a line like this suggests that uh, the LIDAR is pretty good at reflecting how much structure there is in the understory. Um, and that wasn't uh, a given because uh, there are, could be issues with, with um, 
how many pulses get through dense canopies, for example, but in, in general, we see a pretty good fit. And that means that we have good, reliable, we can generate good, reliable spatial estimates of habitat structure. And this is something that we haven't had in the past, and it's going to be really uh, useful for uh, describing bird habitat. I apologize because I forgot to mention that uh, all of the, the bird photos in the in the presentation have been provided by Ken McKilrick and Sam Phaneuf. Um, so the the um, uh, uh, initials on the on the pictures indicate who's provided the photos. I'm uh, not a phot bird photographer myself, and they uh, graciously donated some some photos to dress things up a little bit. Um, okay, so uh, so we've got. We're counting birds, we're looking at habitat, we're linking these things together. What kinds of questions or how are we, how are we using this to address issues of, of forest, uh, uh, sustainable forest management? So um, this is a little bit of a smattering of things. There's lots of different ways to do this that we're, that we're, that we're trying. Um, one thing I'll point out is that we sometimes use single species and sometimes we use com whole communities to describe how, how uh, forest management is changing um, uh, forests. So in terms of communities, um, that gives us, uh, because we have a, a, all sorts of species that are using that habitat differently and changing in different ways, it gives us a little more power to detect change when we use the whole community rather than a single species. But sometimes uh, a single species can tell us a lot as well. So we, we use both of those approaches. We've done a bunch of work where we compared, directly compare landscapes. So we did a project where we had, we worked in Puckasaw Park, right on the edge of the park that was basically um, a, a fire origin landscape. And we compared that to the White River forest that was that was harvested just outside that landscape. So um, we were able to compare uh, a um, uh, that managed forest landscape versus a, basically a reference condition. <clears throat> Another approach we're taking is, uh, and this is all this is data we're collecting actually through the atlas, is a, uh, a direct comparison of sites that are either fire origin. So not landscapes this time, but individual stands that are either fire origin or harvest origin. And looking at those through time. So you can imagine, um, it's very easy to demonstrate a difference between a, a, a mature forest and a harvested forest. But what we're interested, that's not really the question. The question is whether young harvested forest and young burned forest look the same and whether old harvested for old forest that is harvest origin and old forest that is fire origin looks the same and whether we get closer to those things get closer together basically converge um, through time and so th that, those are the kinds of questions that we're asking to see if the forest management is is significantly altering uh, bird habitat um, bird populations and also uh, just ecological integrity in general uh, Another piece that we're looking at is, tre is using trend analysis. There was, um, we did work with uh, Peter Blancher, uh, who was with ECCC at the time, um, where we measured uh, trends of all of the species in boreal Ontario using migration monitoring, uh, breeding bird survey, and Atlas, and Atlas 1 versus Atlas 2. And we found a number of species that were increasing, a number of species that were decreasing, and, 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 uh, the, um, and another group that were, weren't changing much. And what we started to ask questions about were the was the life history of the species that were decreasing? Was there anything? Were there any common patterns in those in those species that might um, be explained by the um, the change in the landscape due to forest management? What we found was what we found was that that we didn't have good evidence that there was a there was a consistent change. For example, um, that species that are more prone to uh, that that, are, that prefer conifer were declining more, even though forest management is thought to reduce the amount of conifer. Um, but we also found that we didn't have a lot of confidence in the data from those, those data sources because uh, we didn't have enough data in the boreal in particular. Um, and so that's, a, that's a, a gap that we're trying to fill with Atlas 3 for sure uh, to try and boost up the density of our bird data for that in that area to, 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 to tackle this question again. Um, we also model and map a lot of habitat. Um, so we talked about the habitat measurements and the birds. We use statistical models to link those two together. And then we map that. And then we ask questions about how different types of forest management might change those, that ha those habitat predictions into the future. And we can rank different 
alternative management scenarios based on 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 um, the habitat outcomes that we see with the birds. So that's a that's a whole lot of information. I apologize. I feel like I just blurted that all of that stuff out. But I just want you to get the point that we're doing a lot of different. Uh, exploring this data in a lot of different ways to ask these questions and it's not a, there's no sort of one right way to do it and the last piece here is the reference condition and I mentioned this at the beginning when I talked about the gap between forest management and natural natural landscapes that natural landscape is the reference condition but we have some, we have an issue with that reference condition question which is climate change the natural condition is being systematically changed by uh, by cha by the changing climate, and so we're going to have to think hard uh, and, fa uh, and fast about what we want our forests to look like, given that all forests are going to be impacted by climate change. How we're going to measure the condition that we want our forests to look like in into the future with climate change, and uh, that's I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges of the forest uh, forest industry and and the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry or all of the other provincial ministries that have to deal with this issue and, and usually think about this stuff in terms of natural disturbance emulation. But, you know, natural disturbance is changing under climate change. So uh, we have a really big challenge there. Um, so I think after all is said and done, I think sort of the take home message here is that is that um, Birds are a really good uh, indicator and group for asking questions about forest management and that we rely heavily on this on citizen science and data from citizen science to answer those questions. And so um, so keep up the good work. And, uh, and I, as I said, um, you know, if you if you if you are at all interested in, in, in a little bit of travel in the next couple of years, um, please come to Northern Ontario and uh, and uh, and do some do some atlasing in our uh, in our forests. Um, and that's that's all I've got. And uh, I'll take some questions if there are any. Thanks, Lisa. That was that was really interesting. I, I learned a lot. So um, I didn't really ever know exactly what kind of work was being done like that. So now I know. Um, we got a bunch of questions here. So I'm just gonna go in order. Um, do birds learn their songs from their parents? Um, when learning their songs, are the birds influenced by their neighbors? I, it's been a long time since I've looked at sort of uh, song learning behavior in birds. It takes me back to, uh, to my graduate work. Um, and so I don't think I should, I should even hazard a guess at okay. that. I, I, think, uh, I think Jennifer Foote is talking, next, is talking tomorrow night uh, and she is uh, an expert in that area and uh, we'll, we'll probably be able to provide a much better, um, better answer. Yeah, that's exactly what I was gonna say. If you uh, stick around for tomorrow, um, Jen should be able to help out with that question. So next one, if four field visits is better than three, is five better than four or does it plateau? Definitely there's a plat plateau. Obviously there's a, there are a, a fixed number of species uh, at any site. So um, if you listen enough, you'll, you'll get to a plateau and people have done a lot of work on, on how many, how many you need to, how many minutes of, of uh, sampling you need to do to get there. Um, and then the question is how, you know, do you need to get to the plateau or is, is where is, where you, you've got basically diminishing returns there. So um, yeah. I think, uh, I mean, I think 40 minutes of sampling is, is probably pretty good uh, as much as you need to do, but, but you could probably get away with less than that and still get good usable data. Great. Um, how are you validating the manual bird song identification? That is, how does the person know they're identifying the species correctly? Does it require visual confirmation? So no, um, and yeah, we uh, there's there, we don't. I guess we don't assume that the um, the manual interpretation is correct necessarily. Uh, it's just the best available, um, and so um, we rely on on experts uh, to to do the to do the manual interpretation. Um, and we, we test them, like we provide, we give, um, uh, basically we, we test them to, to see that their, their interpretation is good, but um, sure, there, there could be mistakes for sure. Yeah, yeah, everyone makes mistakes. I, I know my bird songs pretty well, but I'm sure out of 100 times, I would get a couple wrong. So, um, yeah. but yeah, if that's the best you can do, that's, um, so, okay. So next is, have you integrated any data from ID apps? 
like um, iNaturalist or Smart Bird ID into the work? Um, the short answer is no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so and then our next question here is, have you identified any bird species that are particularly sensitive to disruption? Have you identified pioneer species, um, the first to return to a disturb, um, disturbed area? Uh, yeah, sure. There, there's, I mean, I think um, there are a number of species that are, uh, that we see in the, in the harvested and in some of the burned, uh, early burned sites, um, the, uh, like alder flycatcher, Lincoln sparrow, that kind of thing. Um, um, they, I, I, I hesitate to say, they, they, they are, they respond to, or they're pioneer species to disturbed forests, but that doesn't mean, uh, disturbance is not necessarily bad, I guess is, is what I'd say is that, um, uh, like these, a lot of these ecosystems, especially in the boreal are disturbance driven. So those, they're, that young forest is part of the, uh, of the age class distribution. It's part of the landscape, uh, and it's an important part of the landscape. So, the, as I said before, the, I think that the critical thing is, are we seeing uh, fundamental differences in the species that we see in, um, in the burns and in the, um, uh, in, in the harvested stands um, at, at, the, at a young age? And um, that's a good question. And off the top of my head, I can't think of species that, are, <laughs> that, are, that we're seeing strong responses for. We, we, see, we see changes in the community. Um, but uh, like I said before, the, the, the power to detect change for individual species is, is not great. Um, and so it's more a case of seeing uh, shifts in a number of different species, small shifts in a number of different species. Yeah. Um, great, great, great answers to some really great questions. Um, any other questions? Give it a few seconds here. But it uh, doesn't look like there's any. So thanks again, Lisa. This was, uh, we re appreciate your presentation a lot. And uh, we look forward to definitely uh, participating in the Atlas and uh, providing you with a lot of information for the work that you're doing. So Super. thanks again.